Jeff, you talked before the screening about being out there on season one with Mark. Nothing we've ever done before, nothing we've ever seen before, the great unknown. What I'm curious about is you film all that, you have no, you're not filming that and then the next day it's airing. Right. You, know, you have no, no idea. You get back to the country, you wait a few months, it airs, then what happens? What's the, what's the experience like for you not knowing whether anyone's going to care, care about this? Right. This thing could be off the air in two weeks and then to see it become basically an instant sensation. Can I tell you a story in between those two yeah. moments? <clears throat> I've told this maybe once or twice, so I, but I'm guessing most people haven't really heard it. There was a moment about day 15 or something, and like earlier I said, you know, Mark was kind of trying to figure out the show. I mean, we all were, but Mark was, he was like in this crazy mad scientist place where, but this re idea of rewards to incentivize the tribe was really key, but we weren't, we hadn't quite figured it out. And one thing we hadn't figured it out is that they can't, you can't go from, uh, you know, a thing of rice to a steak, then to an egg. It, it has to escalate. And the players out here, they now know that. And they know the deeper it gets, the rewards have to get bigger. It better be chickens. I mean, we're, we're starving out here. Give us something. We didn't realize that in the first season, we, we, had a sponsor, a beer sponsor, and so it was going to be, you're playing for one cold beer. But it was after they had already won food and other things, and Richard Hatch gets the tree mail and it says a beer, and he basically says, bullshit. This is, this is baloney. Well, the Mark had sold the show to CBS based on the fact that I have all these sponsors, and they're gonna pay for it. That's why it was a risk CBS could take is that you know, it's a bizarre show, but if you're telling me that we can pay for it and we're not going to lose a bazillion dollars, we can do it. So we have to give the beer. And Richard says to the rest of the people, let's just mutiny. Let's just tell them we're going to stop. And we get word back from a producer going, uh, 911, you know, um, here's the problem. And I remember Mark gathering a group of people. And it included John Kerhofer, who is also an original person. He's, a, he's done every single challenge. You know, he's one of our executive producers now, but he was one of the very first guys hired. And he was in this little group, and Mark said, first of all, if the sponsors weren't here, I, I would call their bluff. And I would say, fine, I don't care. I'd get paid either way. Let's just go. <laughs> but I can't do that. Uh, we have to do something. We need an idea. We, we need one quickly. Uh, let's all start talking. And we're trying to figure out what are we going to do. And Kerhofer said there was a show on TNT or TBS called Dinner in a Movie, I think. Kerhofer said, Dinner in a Movie, could we do like some sort of dinner in a movie? And instantly Mark goes, I've got it. They get a cold beer. When they walk up and he complains, you say, and dinner, where you will watch the first 15 minutes of the show you are starring in. And, and we all went, that's amazing. How is that going to happen? <laughs> because we're in the middle of the island. So we had editors on location who had been cutting. And two things happened really quickly. One was somebody got word to base camp that said, we're going to need 15 minutes with some graphics and some titles, put some music on it. Whatever you've got cut, let's just let's look at it. And then the other thing we did is we had a base camp where we lived. And our production designer, Kelly Van Patter, quickly started transforming our actual base camp into what looked like a local Malaysian bar. And we brought in a bunch of locals, and we had a foos table, and everybody was smoking. And it, and it just it felt weirdly kind of like it could have been a bar. And Kelly won. Kelly Wigglesworth won. And we told her, you know, you get to watch the first 15 minutes. And we put her on a boat, and we blindfolded her, and we drove the boat around in circles, right out in the <laughs> same bay of water. <laughs> Like this, <laughs> waiting. I'm on the boat going, are we, are we? No, 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 we're still going. It's quite a ways away. It's, uh, it's where the crew goes. It's a local bar. We pull up, gets out. We have cameras behind blinds. We show her the first 15 minutes, which excited her. And, and, but to your long story to your point, it's when the crew saw it for the first time. And all of us were, were doing the show. And I'm sitting with her, and I'm watching it going, oh my god. This is insane, because we didn't know. And I'm going to say, it was cool, even in the jungle. You, were, you looked at it and went, I've never seen anything like this. These are real people. 
who are actually living in a jungle, and it freaking looks amazing. So that's, that was my first, and then the next thing is when people started watching it and the ratings started to yeah. climb. Well, you know, I remember talking to you and you guys about it, and, and you even, at, at the phenomenal success, of, I mean, just a quick, quick show of hands, who watched the Oscars last night? Like, almost everyone. Okay, so 23 million people watched the Oscars. Those are the ratings. So the Survivor finale had well over double of that. Just think about that. The Survivor season one finale Three times. had, yeah, over the Oscars last night. It was crazy, but you never thought we'd be sitting here 20 years no. later. You never thought, you thought, okay, maybe a few seasons and then, you know, people get sick of it and it, it's a flash in the pan, this, that, whatever. When did you start to realize, wait a minute, this, is a, this could become an institution? When at some point did you realize this is something that can just keep going and going and going? Well, Matt Van Wagenen, who is like my partner on the show, and he, he pushed for quite a while, he was saying, what about 40? And I'm like, dude, would you, can we get through 21? You know, and I didn't see it like he did. I really didn't. I kept, I think maybe partly because the way CBS renews the show is one year at a time, literally almost one season at a time, because they don't know either. They don't know if people are gonna just say, well, I've already seen it, which ties into why we continue to change the show so much is to make sure nobody ever goes, well, I've seen this. You can't say that on Survivor. So I think Matt got me around season 30 or 31, I started thinking we could hit 40. We can get there. Like, we were already talking about ideas. We could do this in 34. We could do this in 36. And if we can get to 38, we can get to 40. And now we're ready to shoot 41. And I'm, I don't want to talk about 41, but it's, it's going to be a different game. It's the same game, but now we're going to, like, let's evolve the society even more. So if you think of it that way, then maybe you can get uh, further. But I don't really like thinking about it. Even now, I was like, I'm not going to say 50. I, I'm going to stick with 40. <laughs> Well, uh, you brought up Matt Van Wagenen, who is here tonight. I will say, when I asked him about 50, he said, and I quote, hell yes. <laughs> well, that, that's Matt. <laughs> that's why Matt's always the good cop and I'm always the bad cop. <laughs> Matt's eternally optimistic. Well, as you know, as you, there's been so much change about Survivor, and this is something you and I talk about all the time, how the show has to evolve and change and grow. And if you watch the first episode of season one, it, it feels like a different show in many yeah. ways. And uh, you know, the, the, uh, the casting has changed, the uh, creative has changed, the editing techniques you use have changed. So if you look from one to 40, there are still, the DNA is still there, but, but what's the biggest difference to you? What's the biggest difference in terms of this entire road and you've been there the entire time looking from one to 40, then to now, I 20 years? I would say that the, the people who started the show in the beginning, the storytellers, they laid this groundwork that it is ultimately about people. This is their story. I think in the very first season we say, these 16 people are walking through this small village in Malaysia. This is their story. I've never lost that. I've never seen Survivor as a game show when people say, oh, you, you host a game show. I, I go, are you talking to me? I don't, because I don't see that reflection in the mirror. I see a storyteller. That's always what I've wanted to do. And what I think is cool about telling the stories of real people is that they're real. Ben was hilarious because he saw what we all saw, which is, yeah, Rob does have this weird thing. And then if you put him with poverty, it, why, the, why are we not getting, those are real, it's not scripted. So I think all we've done is evolve it. And you know, the, a lot of storytellers are here tonight. We get inspired by, like there was a show, there was a great documentary on, um, um, uh, Dre, I uh, can't remember what it's called. What was that HBO documentary, Matt? The Defiant, the Defiant Ones. And they did something in there where they, just about the way they were cutting it, and I called Matt, I go, you know, we could, we could break our own mold. We don't have to stay in the linear time. And, you know, so the editors start playing with, what if we don't show somebody find an idol? What if we tell you they found it, and then we show you a flashback? So we're still going to show you, but we're going to, and that's, Doing, we're doing that now with music. We just cut something in episode four. Well, we started with this woman. You better get ready. This is how, okay, my son is here right now, and this is, this is how fun Survivor is. Somebody can have a, an idea on our show. Like, I was in my car and I thought, I wanna hear like a Cajun grandma narrate every episode. 
The original idea was, what if at the beginning of every episode, somebody said once upon a time? Whatever it meant, but it was kind of once upon a time. So I have my little iPhone, I go, you better get ready, they're coming for you. Whatever, put it in my phone, send, send it to a friend of mine, who's a big time music producer, and say, do you have any voice, like a woman? She goes, yeah, she's in the studio right now, I could have her. Put something on an iPhone. An hour later, on my phone, I get back this singer, Maisie, who just sang with Elton John the other night, or last night, and she's, she's got this incredible voice. You better get ready. I'm like, holy shit, this, I said, Matt, I got, it's an iPhone. John heard our post, can we, and like cut something in. An hour later, we have a version that's basically that. And we do that on our show all the time. And what's funny I say about my son is he heard me in the kitchen, he's like, are you telling me that's gonna be in the show? And I said, well, not my voice, but he's a filmmaker, and what I'm trying to show him is, yeah, just, why not? I mean, so we get all this permission from CBS. I mean, honestly, we don't get notes on our episodes. That's unheard of, unheard of in television. And I usually say, good, we shouldn't. When these guys deliver one, when we're finally done and we hand it to CBS, I feel like we've delivered a perfect episode. It's magical. Every sound, every... Every sound. <laughs> so I think we've evolved. The, I think we've just evolved the storytelling. I'm giving you long answers. Sorry. No, it's it's cool. We're, and we're going to bring some other uh, people up here in just a minute. But I want to ask you one last thing before we do. We obviously don't want any spoilers. But when you finished season 40, and you go and you say, "I'll go get the votes," and you bring the votes back and you tell everyone, "All right, great season. I'll see you on Los Angeles." You walk off the tribal council set. You, you hopefully are getting on a jet ski or a paddleboard or something, I don't know. Uh, right? <laughs> right? Right? But you do all that. Tell us, what are you feeling? What are we going to be feeling when we get to that epic po point? Um, well, that's two different things. What, the, what I fe was feeling, that was a very long summer because these guys are, they're no picnic in terms of, um, they hold you accountable. Yeah that you cannot get away with anything. And meaning like if I, ask a, if I ask a statement and pose it as though it's a question, you know, it wouldn't, doesn't surprise me when Wendell, it, he'll say, is there a question? I'm like, oh my God, you know what I'm going for. Okay, hang on. Um, you know, so it's that, it's, it's hardcore. They, as, as much as people say you gotta get through me, to, I have to get through them. I mean, they're great storytellers. That's why they're on the show. So I'm exhausted when it's over. And I'm not comparing my situation to them. It's not the same. But like Kelly said, producing the show is a very different, it's its own adventure. But what the audience is going to feel, I think, is that Survivor as we know it is over. They killed it. They, there's just nothing left. I mean, the picture would be ruins. It would be, it would be like you're in Rome and you're going, and what happened here? And they said, oh, there was a, they, they called it the, the war. And uh, it was a bunch of people and they played this weird game. It was, in, it was a spectator sport, like the Coliseum. <laughs> That's what it felt like. Let's bring them up one at a time. Let's get, first of all, the winner of Survivor, Micronesia, Parvati Shallow, everyone. She's coming to the stage right next to Jeff. We've got the winner of Redemption Island, Boston Rob Mariano right here. The winner of Survivor All-Stars, Amber Mariano. You got a two for one there, people. The winner of Survivor Africa, Ethan Zahn, right there. There he is. The winner of South Pacific, Sophie Clark is walking to the stage. The winner of Ghost Island, Wendell Holland, ladies and gentlemen, the smooth criminal. And the winner of Survivor Pearl Islands and the winner of Heroes vs. Villains, Sandra Diaz Twain. Um, guys, uh, Jeff, Jeff said before the screen, he taught us, talked us, brought us all the way back to season one, the very beginning, what he was feeling as he's sitting out there at Mark Burnett. I want to go down the line and ask each of you what you remember from your very first day of playing Survivor. Parvati, we'll start with you. Day one, Cook Islands. What do you remember from that experience? You're really taking me back, Tom. <laughs> yeah, that's what we did. Um, I just remember being so seasick because we were on this pirate ship and it was really choppy. 
And I was looking around like, what did I sign up for? And then Jeff was like, all right, game on. Like, get out of here. And everyone starts jumping off the boat. And I'm like, all right, I guess that's what we do. And jump off the boat and like grab a chicken and get on a raft. Did you lose your lunch? I know a lot of people lost their lunch that I day. I came very close, but I didn't. Yule, for sure, was vomiting a lot. <laughs> yeah. uh, Rob, what about you? What do you remember from Marquesas, season four? I was a kid. I mean, I was literally just out of college. I was working my first job. I remember how cold it was in Boston, and there was this opportunity to go to an island somewhere. And what a lot of people don't remember is that season four Marquesas happened right after 9-11 the World Trade Center bombing. And we were originally gonna go to Jordan to film that season, and it was the last minute they switched it to the Marquesas. And I just remember feeling like really grateful to have the opportunity. I don't even think I thought about the strategy of the game so much as that I was like on an island having fun in the middle of the South Pacific, and it wasn't until after that first season that I was like, oh man, I just blew a once in a lifetime opportunity. Mm -hmm. Little did I know, you know, so many years later, everything that would evolve. Amazing. Amber, season two. <laughs> season two, people. Survivor, yeah. Australian Outback. What do you remember from your first day? Um, well, I, I was fresh out of college and a kid as well. I think I was the youngest player um, on my season. And, um, I, I was fresh out of college, only a month out, I think, and still living at home with my parents. And we sat down to watch this show about 16 people thrown on an island and forced to survive. And I thought, these people are nuts. Why would you ever want to do this? Three episodes in, I told my parents, I've got to do this. <laughs> and I was so miserable. I, I was that college graduate who thought, oh, I've got a college degree. I'm going to graduate and get this great job and be super successful, and everything will be awesome. Well, I was working, working some temp job, just filing. I was so miserable. And one day during my lunch break, I heard they were having auditions for the next season. So I went over my lunch break, and they said, here, fill out this form and go stand in front of that camera. And I said, OK. So I filled out this form, and I got in front of the camera, and they said, all right, go. I'm like, you guys aren't going to ask me any questions or anything? They said, no, go. You got a minute. And I said, hi, I'm Amber. I want to be on Survivor. I don't even know. I think I said I, I dreamt that Jeff uh, told me in a dream that I was going to be on the show. And it's so weird, but deep down inside, when I it was at a Best Buy, I walked out and I knew I was going to be on the show. I knew they were going to pick me. And we were, I, I remember going out to LA and we we're down to like the final 48 people. And I had just done, you know, all these final interviews with all these big executives. And I heard a knock on my door and open it up. And Mark's standing there. And he's like, congratulations. <laughs> You're going on Survivor. You're going to Australia. And I said, that's awesome. Let's go. And he said, how do you feel about jumping out of a plane? <laughs> and I said, OK, let's go. Luckily, that, 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 uh, that plan changed. So I didn't have to do that. <laughs> but I was pumped. I was excited that first day. We're out there, and gosh, we had a super long hike to our camp. We had to go through a river, and there were crocodiles, and there were, all of a sudden you'd be walking, you get to stop because a big kangaroo comes jumping across. You know, it's, it was spectacular, and it's 20 years ago. 20 years ago, look where I am. I'm sitting here watching season 40 with my husband, who I met on the show. It's insane. Unbelievable story. Uh, Ethan, uh, season three, Africa, what do you remember from the uh, I remember taking, we flew into Nairobi, then we got in a little puddle jumper, then we're gonna truck. We just kept getting further and further away from civilization. And then when Jeff said go, I remember jumping off that truck at a thing of water, it cracked, and then I tried to have a conversation with Big Tom and could not understand a freaking thing he was saying. And I'm like, this is gonna be a disaster. I don't know what's going on. My mom's probably freaking out right now. It's funny because back then, like you guys didn't know where you were going. No. They, like, like they, you know, now people with they've set up shop in Fiji, they have a pretty good idea where they're going. But you guys literally had no idea. They just drop you off somewhere, and there you are. It's crazy. Sophie, uh, Survivor South Pacific. What do you remember about that? 
I remember being put out in a boat in the water and being told we were going to row in and that was going to start the season. And I'd flown out to Samoa with so much confidence and I had like lost it over the five days of press interviews. And I'd been convinced that like everybody around me must be Olympic athletes or Nobel Prize winners. And I was like, totally screwed and going to be voted out first. And then I remember the moment we all started rowing was the moment I thought, like, I can totally win these things, this thing, because nobody knew how to row a boat. Like, at least I knew how to row a bow. Like, they, people had never touched a paddle before. Um, so that was, like, that was my best moment and my only moment and my first moment. I remember I asked you, uh, Sophie, I when, I, when, I, when I was out there for Winners of War interviews, I asked you, what was your first impression when you first saw John Cochran before that game? Do you remember what you told me? Uh, probably a dodgeball target. Dodgeball yeah. target is what she said <laughs> when she met Cochran. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Uh, Wendell, Survivor Go Style, and what do you remember about that uh, start off? Well, uh, it was so long ago. Let me think back. <laughs> Jeez. Um, now, what I remember is um, I looked at my tribe, and I thought I had what looked to be a strong tribe. And I saw quite a few big guys. and. They all wanted to build things, like Dom wanted to build the shelter this way, Chris wanted to do this way and show, show how strong he was and chop the bamboo with one, one whack and all that. And I'm like, man, I know how to build stuff. Like, I can build this shelter for you jokers, but they wanted to do it. So I just, I just took a back seat and just let them do their thing at first. And then as I got my footing, I kind of reconfigured things. Um, but one other thing that stuck in my mind was a couple days prior, um, when I went in, I think it was one of the huts on Ponderosa, Jeff, and I, I had my little meeting with Jeff. He said, Wendell, how did you get here? And then he told me he fought for me to get on that season. And I've always took that into Survivor. Like, man, Jeff Probst fought for me. So Ghost Island, I was like, man, I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to just work my hardest because this guy that I've been watching for so many years fought for me. So. I just want to say that, that that is true, because I, I could imagine people might think, well, he says that to everybody. Wendell was just one of these cases where Matt and I just completely disagreed with the decision that the network made, <laughs> which was, we don't see it. And we went back in and said, we're falling on our sword. This guy is a star. He's a hero. He's a likable winner. Whether we get him for one episode or till the end, it doesn't matter. We must have him. And this is what I was referring to earlier. They go, OK, if you're that passionate, we don't see it, but go for it. And I can say now, we were right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Sandra, you had an incredible first experience in Provence because they told you guys, hey, we're taking you to do some press interviews, and then threw you off a boat. Uh, and you got to go pit, uh, steal and pillage and stuff. What do you remember from the very beginning of your uh, survivor experience? I remember being in the airport in Miami, but not knowing where we were going. We didn't know the location back then. And then we were at the gate, and we were headed to Panama. And I was like, oh, that's good, because I speak Spanish. And then we're on this older yacht, and they're like, OK, now you got to jump into the water with the clothes on your back. And I remember being told, whatever you bring, you have to carry it, so you decide what you want to bring. So I kind of had all these solid color outfits, and I was going to change my clothes up, not knowing I was going to jump into the water with just my top, my pants, which people call like a prison outfit because of the orange color it was, <laughs> and having the same panties and bra for 39 days. <laughs> So we jump into the water, and Jeff is like, OK, now you got to swim to that, to that island over there. And I didn't plug my nose. And immediately, I jump in, not thinking. I don't even know how I ended up in the water. I didn't plug my nose. Now I'm drowning. I felt like I was sure. drowning. So I grabbed onto that raft, and I never let go. <laughs> and then when we got to the village, then I just emerged again. I was like, OK, let me help my tribe gather up a bunch of stuff. And that was one of those really, really historic scenes that made the Pearl Islands what it was because people loved that scene of us pillaging and, and going through, the, um, through that island over there when we went into that, um, that town, that village. It's, yeah, it's, a, and it's a, just a great season from top to bottom. And, and you know, the, part of the joy and the fun in this season is seeing all of you guys back on the island. But, but I am curious, especially, I don't know if you guys could hear or see Ethan watching that premiere, but that dude was stoked. He was loud, he was into it, he was psyched. And you know, for Ethan and Amber, I wanna ask you guys, because it's what, 16 years for you two to come back to the island. What was it like 
day one as you walk slash fall off the boat. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, what was it like, uh, Amber, we'll start with you, 16 years, that first day when you were like, okay, it's real, I'm walking out, I see Jeff there, and here we go. It didn't seem real. It felt like I was dreaming. I could not believe I was back there again. My heart was racing so fast. I was so nervous. I was so scared. Um, I was excited to look across and see my husband. That was the only comfort I had. But I was so scared because it had been 15 years. I'm a totally different person. I'm married with four children. I'm a mom. I'm, I'm not that kid. I'm an adult now. <laughs> and um, these players, they're all the best. And I don't know. I, I'm so glad I, I was there, but I don't. I, I just felt very lucky to be there because I just know that um, I'm amongst the best. So, Ethan, what about you? You know, very similar feelings. And I remember just you know trying to get ready for season four. I went back and watched a lot of the season. I watched Africa, and it was like we were playing underwater. You know, it's like slow motion, you know, we honor integrity, you know, like <laughs> teamwork. And it's yeah. just like a slow TV. And then obviously I've watched all the seasons and it just gets faster and quicker and faster and there more clues and ways to get back in the game and idols and now money. So like, I was incredibly nervous. I didn't know if I could keep up with the pace of the game. Uh, however, it was exciting, heart thumping, and you just gotta have to, you know, rely on what you feel you're, you're good at out I there. You know, I, I, I've been on location a lot, as you guys know, and, and uh, it's always exciting. Day one is always exciting. But there are certain seasons where it's even more so. And Jeff, I want to ask you, if you could pass uh, Jeff a mic, guys. Is there a difference for you when you look out at these people as opposed to a, you know, another season? Is there just a little extra yeah. something? Yeah. You saw, like I mean, I said I need to take this in. The, the best part of the job hosting Survivor is that there was no there was nobody before me, so I didn't have to be like somebody, so I'm just me, so that's genuine. I was, I couldn't believe it, <clears throat> because my whole life is different because of these guys. You know, their, their lives is, are different because of Survivor, but my life is different because of Survivor, and Survivor exists because of them. So I look at all of them and I go, damn, man, I got a great family, I got a house, I have a wife, I have a life, all because of this. So when they, even though, we were just going crazy with trying to figure out how we were going to do this whole fire token thing. When they showed up, first the guys came, and then the women came. And as they were walking up, I was looking at it going, um, kind of like what Amber and Ethan said. It was sort of like, it's happening. This is how the hell did we get here 20 years later? This is kick ass. Let's do it. Yeah, there's something when you see them all lined up like that. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing. And I'm always always aware that if you walked into this right now and had no idea what Survivor was, you would think it was some sort of either cult or Amway thing or a multi-level, because like who talks about this about a TV show? We do. Uh, Sandra, I want to go to you because we can talk about this because it was in the first five minutes that uh, they showed in the Survivor retrospective special last week, and we see you when you see Amber and Rob, and you are not happy. Uh, you just spent 36 days with Rob out on the island. He said, I'm never going back to play. You see him out there. Just take me through what you're feeling and thinking at that moment. Well, the fact that Rob knew that I was going out there, and I'm the kind of person where 99% of the time, if you ask me something, I'm going to tell you straight up what it is. So the fact that he knew... I don't know, I guess I wanted that phone call. Even if it wasn't, Sandra, let's align, let's do something, just A, hey, see you in a week or so. That was all, I guess. I don't know why I was so hurt about it. And even right now, it's kind of, and a lot of people, yes, I know Rob, but I had never met Amber before. Even when I saw her at the hotel before we went to the airport, I saw her from the side, I didn't even recognize her. I thought it was somebody working with uh, Survivor. And then she gets on the bus, you know, as we're getting on to go to the terminal to the airport. And then I realized it's Amber. Mm -hmm. So when Rob told me no, when he said no, he wasn't going and Amber had no desire to ever play again, that was it, you know. I don't know why it affected me so much, and it still does. I don't know. I was, like, hurt about it, really. Rob, tell me about the position. You're out there. She's saying, I'm going back. You have a decision to make. 
You're already gaming, so I'm clearly, I'm guessing this is a game mode. Well, two reasons, two reasons, really. Number one, first and foremost, I come from the old school mentality that the game starts when Jeff says go. So there's a little bit of this notion of pre-game alliance that feels dirty to me. I don't like it. I understand that people do it now, and it's part of the game, and the game's evolved, you know, but I've always been of the mindset that the game starts when Jeff says go. You don't know how the teams are going to be divided. You don't know what the twist may or may not be. And why am I going to pigeonhole myself into a position that could handcuff me later? So that's the first reason. The second reason is Sandra is a very accomplished player. She's the only one up until this season so far that we've seen that has won the game twice. And I know that that information is power. I said it over and over on the Island of the Idols. So why am I going to give her information that could possibly hurt my game? And that was it. It wasn't anything personal. And for the record, I called no one before this game started. Not Tyson. The only person that I had discussions about season 40 with was my wife. That's 100% true, and I know there are rumors out there that Rob talked to Tyson before he went out there, and he did not. <laughs> he is very old school. I'm the same way. It does. It feels dirty to make these alliances or talk about the game before it even starts. So. And I, and I will just say, because I can tell it's genuine, I can see why Sandra feels that way, because these guys worked very hard on season 39, which is its own Q&A, they produced those segments. We would we would give them the material and tell them this is what we you know what we want to do, but then it was up to them to put it in their words and to figure out their their straight man comedy routine. You know, and they both fell into roles where Rob said, "I'll do the explaining," and Sandra, "You pop off whenever you want," and it worked really well. But I can see from Sandra's point of view, it was such an intimate relationship that you guys were. Truly producing a, an element of a show together, but I will also say, Sandra, that I remember him telling me because pregame we talked to every player, and he goes, "I'm not going to tell her." And I remember saying to him, "Man, that's risky." And he goes, "But I just don't know yet. Like I don't know what the right thing to do. I just I'm not sure." He never it never was a um, calculated move against you as yeah. much as it was. And for the record, like I love you, you know that. What well, we had on Island of the Idols, and it wasn't. Anything intentional, it was just my mindset going into it. I appreciate it. And, and for the no, and for the record, like every everyone knows that when I applied for Survivor, there's always that one question that says, What survivor are you most like? And I always Rob knows I wrote Boston Rob. For some reason, I always clicked with him, and I always told him, you know, we have that mouth, we pop off. Yes, he's Italian, I'm Puerto Rican, he's from Boston, I'm from Connecticut. Like we get it, like there was something always about Boston Rob that I aspired to be like him and play with him and I don't know, like it was just, I always saw him up here and that's where Mutual I wanted respect. To, to be, so. Cheers. I'll take it one step further. In, in my, uh, you know, every day I've been posting my interviews with the cast and Sanders is going up last as the two-time winner and she told me out there in Fiji that not only were you the player she admired, you're the reason she applied for Survivor. It's you. Yeah. So it's deep stuff. Awesome. Awesome. And you guys got your statues, and then all the other players saw your statues uh, before the game started. I want to hear from a few of them. Wendell, what did you think when you saw a giant Boston Rob and Sandra statue uh, as your game started? I thought that was pretty good for my game. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think CBS needs to increase the budget so we could have got some blue tarps out there. <laughs> Maybe something to cover that up pregame. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, if they didn't have a big enough target on their backs, you know, just going in and knowing, coming in with the understanding, or, you know, you hear rumblings that it's probably going to be an all winter season. Seeing these wonderful, beautiful statues uh, solidified that, and I think, um, yeah, it it was good to see. <laughs> Parvati, were you happy you didn't have a statue oh, up there? Yeah, man, I was like, yeah, 
the targets off me for the first day, hopefully. All right, now hold on a as second. As now hold me. on a second, because <laughs> well, Parvati, that's a you, lie. Parvati, you told I'm me lying. Sandra was not giving you a good vibe before the game. Sandra was not giving me a good vibe before the game. Yeah. She was like, you know, we got pregame, we got press, and like we got to be around each other, but we can't talk to each other. So I'm looking at Sandra, like, feeling her out, like, hey, girl, we cool? Queen? Dang. We I'm cool? sorry. <laughs> I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was split men versus women, so I was really like, yeah, this game is going to be red. The women are going to dominate. And then they pulled the a fast one on you. Yeah, they did. They tend to do that on this show. Uh, I I've say noticed. something? I was, yeah. I was happy to know that it was Tyson and Parvati and Boston Rob. I felt like the villains could have done something together. So, you know, but like, we never know where we're gonna end right. up. Yeah. So, yeah. and Parvati in Heroes vs. Villains looked out for me and she didn't have to. And I always told her that I felt like I owed her one. So if there was ever an opportunity for me to pay her back, I would have, because I would have remembered what she did for me before. So, I don't know that I looked at you cross-eyed or so. I'm, I don't, I don't well, remember. It's interesting to Rob's point, though, because that goes to the whole pregame thing, because you don't know even who you're going to be with. And that changes everything when you step on the beach. Uh, Sophie, um, we've spoken uh, before about how you're someone that has been talked about coming back. And you've gotten the calls to maybe come back. Never quite made it back until now. What was it like? hoping as a winner, like, when am I going to get back on this show? I mean, you said you were crushed at one point, that you were close to coming, but didn't quite make it. Uh, yeah, I felt like I went from, like, A to Z very quickly. I could have used, like, a little bit of a middle ground, maybe seasoned. Um, but, I mean, it, it, I dove right in with all of the big dogs. I think the day one, I felt overwhelmed by the legends I was amidst and had to kind of force myself to convince myself I was just as good and step, step into it. You did. You felt how little, like uh, you felt like you weren't up to the not up to the task, but you felt like that you weren't worthy in a sense on your day one out there. Uh, I think you know all the winners win in a different way, and some of them win in like really cool ways. When you're a fan, and you're watching them on TV. You think I want to be Boston Rob. Um, and I won partially because I was sitting next to a lunatic, and that's <laughs> not necessarily what people look up to. Like, I want to be that girl sitting next to that lunatic one day. Aww. You know, it's just like not the, it's not the idol people have. So I definitely had a, a feeling of like, I have, I have something to prove out here. But there's, you know, there's only 20 spots for this season. How tough would it have been to have not been in this season? Yeah, that would have been cruel. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like that almost happened. Uh, <laughs> did anybody else notice whiplash on day one, like the speed of the game? But like the, the speed of the game, just, I mean, even for, yeah, even Wendell. Well, I want to ask Wendell about it because you're a new player, right? We expect the older players, oh, they're not used to this. Uh, you know, there were no idols. Uh, there was none of these other twists and advantages. Wendell, you played very recently, and it still felt different to you. It certainly felt different. Um, as you saw at the end of that, um, of what we were able to see, um, people turn it on. And it seemed like people were running laps, telling lies to everybody on DeKal Beach. And I thought I was a product of this new school survivor. But I quickly saw that the older players adapted very fast, um, a good amount of them, a good amount of them. and. I don't know if I was ready for that speed, because literally, we were, we were running laps, people were telling lies, I would hear a name, and then someone would come around that corner, and then I'd hear another name, and it would happen again and again, and um, then people would be scared to say names, and it was just, uh, it was so elevated that um, it was cool to be a part of. I experienced a headache sitting right there watching it begin because of how crazy it was out there. And I think what also makes this season so different from any returning season is all of the relationships that are formed outside of the game with all the different players. So people think that because Rob and Sandra and I and Tyson have played together before that we're all tight and we've had this bond for a really long time, but you just don't know what's real. Like certain people have dated, certain people have like are <laughs> godparents of each other's kids and like you just don't know who's with who and like who's playing you and who's saying like, oh, I've been out of the loop for so long. I have no idea what's happening. And you're like, wait, do I really? 
I'm not, and I feel like I've been out of the loop for a long time too. So that was like for me the biggest challenge going in this time, like very different from Heroes Villains on a returning season. Here's what I want to do. I want to have some, uh, some fun right now. You guys uh, remember a survivor challenge called Touchy Subjects? You want to remember that one? You guys, some of you guys have probably played these. So the way that this works is that it was a challenge where everyone had to, was asked a series of questions by Jeff, and they had to answer what they thought was going to, what they thought the majority of people were going to answer. Uh, we're going to do a version of that. This where, is bad news. This yeah, bad this is going to be I didn't like great. this, but I played it in the game. <laughs> yeah, I don't that's know right. I, like I got now. you up here. You think it's all easy, and this is what we do. Uh, and so what we're going to do is I have a series of questions, and they have, are going to have a series of name cards. I'm going to ask the questions, and then they are going to show the answer, reveal on three their answer that they want to say, and uh, just not whatever the majority is, just what you want to say. You cannot vote for yourself, okay? Right. Or Jeff, but Jeff is going to play along and vote for one of you. Oh, so I'll great. take one and pass these on. Got it. Take a step, uh, one step. <laughs> Let's do it. Get to it. You guys need to all vote for the same person. Wendell, everything for Wendell. All right, pass it down. Look at your cards. You have one of everybody's name there. I'll ask you a question, then don't show your answer to all reveal on three. Okay, question number one. Who is the person you don't want to be sitting next to at a final three? Who is the person, don't reveal Parvati. Oh. <laughs> Who is the person you don't want to be sitting next to at a final three? Everyone ready? Reveal on one, wait, all right. One, two, three, reveal. We got Rob, Ethan, Ethan, Parvati. Rob, Sophie, what do you got? I can't see. Ethan, Parvati, Parvati. Wow. wow. Pretty oh, split there. Uh, all right, you said Ethan. Uh, why? Because he survived cancer. I mean, how can you beat that? You're weaponizing my cancer against me. How dare you? I can't win against that. Same answer. Same answer. <laughs> all right, next question. Who is the person you don't want to have on the puzzle for your tribe in a challenge? <laughs> Who is the person you don't want to have on the puzzle for your tribe in a challenge? Yeah, that is hard. That is really hard. You need a probes card, because I... <laughs> <laughs> okay, pick every, everyone got one, almost ready. All right, one, two, three, reveal. Uh, Rob, what do you got? You got Sandra, Parvati, Ethan, Sandra, Rob, Amber, Sandra. Sandra, what do you got? You Wendell. Hey, Wendell. 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 Wendell sucks at the challenge. Wendell sucks at the challenges. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Saw so it today. All right, let's uh, let's go to our next you were great one. Great on that bench. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -oh. This is why I love this challenge so much. Bring it back, Probst. Bring it back. Who is the person you don't want to have to face in an endurance challenge? Who is the person you don't want to have to face in an endurance challenge? Okay, a few options. All right, everyone ready? Reveal I'm one. Ready. Ready. Okay. okay one, two, three, reveal. Wendell, Sophie, Parvati, Rob, Parvati, Parvati, Sophie, Parvati. Now, Parvati, we all know, holding the arm up in the air yeah. is, uh, is, is great. That We had a few, who had Sophie on, on theirs? I, uh, you did, why'd you have Sophie? Sophie is an athletic beast. She is like a soccer player and she's incredibly determined. There's like nothing that can crack Sophie. All right. Well said. Uh, next one. Who is the least trustworthy person in the game? <laughs> least trustworthy person in the game. This is so easy. <laughs> <laughs> Reveal. Parvati, Sandra, 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 Sandra. Wow. Explain yourself. Wow. Because I couldn't vote for myself. <laughs> wow. Amber, I, I'll give yeah. this to you. Amber, why Sandra? Because she revealed it on this, this first episode. Every time she 
time she heard a name, sorry, she revealed it on this first episode. Every time she hears a name, she runs to that person and tells them. I mean, she, you cannot <laughs> trust her. It was, it was almost a clean sweep. But you, uh, Jeff, you had Parvati. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to me, well, I, I get it with Sandra, but I've never seen Sandra. I, I wouldn't trust you ever, <laughs> ever. And the more you look at someone and go, me, the more I go, 100%. <laughs> I'll trust Rob, even though I watched Rob murder Lex after Lex saved his wife. Listen, I told you I'd help you if I can. I am sorry, I cannot. <laughs> Sandra, you had Rob. Any explanation needed for that? or is a... I just had to pick somebody because I knew it was going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do the, flip. Let's do the but, flip side of that. But yeah. I was never like that, not all the time. There was a time that I was a different kind of player, but I don't have a choice now, nowadays. You know, I, I have such a big target on my back. Um, well, here's the last one. Who is the cockiest person on this stage? Who is the cockiest person also easy on this stage? All right, one, two, three, reveal. Wendell, Amber, Rob, Sandra, Rob, Sandra, Rob, Rob. Wow. Rob voted for himself, so we'll give him this one. Rob, why, uh, why'd you vote for yourself? I talk a lot, but I can back it up. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right, uh, we are going to go to a, a few uh, fan questions uh, out in the audience. Once again, guys, uh, please, we're not going to talk about the episode, so don't ask anything about that. No spoilers, nothing of that uh, nature. Let's go first. We have a celebrity question from this three-time Survivor player, Andrea Belke is here, ladies and gentlemen. Come on down, Andrea. Come on. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Um, OK, so my question is about the fans. Since many of you have been involved in the Survivor community for many years, some decades, what's been the coolest or most memorable fan encounter that you've had? Ethan, I know we were talking earlier. You had a really special one. So if you want to kick it off. Yeah. Actually, literally, it just happened like two nights ago. I was in Boca Raton, Florida. At a Jewish event, shocker. And um, this 82-year-old woman walks in and she had about 20 pictures of my father, who had passed away when I was 14, pictures of him and her making out on dates. This is the whole part of my life. She traveled all the way to come see me so she could show me pictures of my dad that I'd never seen before. And it was uh, a pretty, you know, opened up a whole new door to my, my life uh, knowledge of my father that I never knew before. So that was a crazy event. I have one. Um, I, a kid named Max, who had cerebral palsy, asked me to be his make-a-wish date for a Survivor finale. And Anna O'Grady was there, and she like set up this whole lunch, and it was really special. Like All of the survivors from Micronesia and from that season came by and said hi to him at this lunch. And we're still friends. Like He's still going strong. He's at um, university now, and he bakes cupcakes. He's amazing. Great. It's awesome. Um, all right, let's get a few more questions. I'll do my best to see you. Uh, raise your hand in the air, and I see one in the very back row. Sir, go ahead, or ma'am, I can't see you too well. Raise your uh, hand and uh, tell us your name and uh, ask your question, please. All righty, my name is Max. Um, just want to say thank you to all of you. Um, I grew up watching Survivor. I'm going to be 18 in about three weeks. My goal is to go on the show. Jeff, you once interviewed me at the finale, Kagiyan. It's in my audition tape. Anyways, <laughs> my question is for Rob, just because it's a kind of a personal question about the game, uh, just something I've always remembered. When you were casted to play against, te technically against Russell in Redemption Island, and when he got voted out fairly quickly, when did you then, re was it then when you once realized you were pretty sure you had the game in the bag, or the entire way through, you never really know, like, because it's Survivor, if you have the game in the bag or not. You know, um, that season was pretty epic for me. But I worked. Like, everybody saw how easy it looked for me on TV, or that's how it seemed for a lot of people that watched it. But the fact is, I worked so hard that season. Someone like Andrea can tell you, I never slept. I always dotted my I's and crossed my T's. And I didn't know, even up until 
the last challenge. There's four of us left. It's myself, Natalie, Philip, and Ashley. And I know <laughs> that I've brought these people to the end with me so I can hopefully beat them in the end. I've positioned myself perfectly. But at that moment, I know I have to win this challenge. If I don't win this challenge right here and now, they're going to figure it out, and I'm going to be the fourth place finisher, and I'm going to have to vote for one of them. So it wasn't until, I think, after I won that final challenge that it really started to set in, that I did everything I could that season, and I had a chance, you know, a legitimate shot to win the show. Yeah, I remember Jeff telling me after that, he goes, the guy didn't sleep. He didn't sleep for 39 days, working, always working. All right, another question right there in the corner. Yes. Tell us your name. Hey, my name is Mason Snyder. Um, I, too, have applied countless times. And, uh, <laughs> and I have a two-year-old daughter. And I think now, I've been applying since long before we had her. And I, and I oftentimes think, how am I going to explain one day when I'm on this show, my actions being on there and playing the way that I know you need to play in a lot of cases in order to win. A lot of you guys played before you had kids and you're now playing with kids. How did having kids for you guys impact the way that you played the game in the sense of you're gonna have to come home and answer to your kids for how you played, right? I mean, there's a whole new audience outside of people that you don't know that you're gonna have to say, yeah, mommy did that or daddy did that. It's a, I, let's start with Parvati, who's the newest uh, mom here. Uh, interesting question, talking about now having someone that's going to be watching you play at, when she gets a little older. Yeah, my daughter doesn't <laughs> sit still for five seconds, so I don't think she'll be watching the show. But um, I, it, the hardest thing was just going back out there and leaving a 10-month-old baby at home and... Like, um, I forget, Rob, did you say that you hadn't left, or no, Tyson in the premiere says he hadn't left his kids for more than a day. Like, I hadn't left my baby for more than like a couple of hours. So it was such a huge shift for me to, to like prepare myself mentally and emotionally to be gone for that long. So I wasn't really necessarily thinking like, when she's old enough, she's gonna watch mommy like really crushing people's dreams out here. Well, I, 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 would, I would just be curious from the audience standpoint, does that resonate with most of you that you think after 40 seasons that players still need to justify lying and manipulating and persuading? Yeah, I, I, that would be, that's reassuring to me because I feel like Outwit Out Play at last has been pretty established that what Sandra did when she said, I'm just going to go lie, we laughed. That's a great move. And then nobody talking to Kim. It's funny. It's not personal. It's just a game. But the game is mind manipulation inside the jungle with the million dollar prize where you have to live together to survive and vote each other out to move forward. But the people you vote out have to like you enough in the end to give you the million dollars. Super complex. Very much so. Great question. Uh, right there, somewhere around the, the light. Yes, right there. Go ahead, yeah, just stand up. Uh, Richard Hatch was a long time ago. And one of, his, one of Richard Hatch's strategies was to run around naked. I was wondering if that would fly today. No. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a good question. And it, it speaks to the fact that the survivor is always of the moment because it's fresh and I mean, notwithstanding returning players, you, you typically have new people playing and whatever's happening in the culture is what's happening. No one thought anything of that first season other than it was you know, not that attractive to look at, <laughs> but we didn't think anything about it. Today it wouldn't, it wouldn't get past one of our producers for half of a second. It would be, no, 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 what, you know, what's going on? Same reason Millennials Gen X was so interesting to me is that it really was of the moment. And we, even in casting, I was laughing with Matt saying, you know there's going to be somebody on Gen X that's going to say at some point, you know, Jeff, when I was young, and sure enough, this guy toward the end goes, you know, Jeff, when I was young, we listened to records, oh, my God, on vinyl? Oy. But that was of the moment. We were all talking about Millennials and how they're this or they're that. And I found myself leaning into the millennials going, I want to be around those people, not listening to vinyl. <laughs> I still listen to vinyl. Uh, yes, uh, two over from the person we just had. Yes, yes. Uh, so 
Dalton, I, sorry, I used to ditch, pretend to be sick when I was little so I could call in to Survivor Live, so this is pretty surreal. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Old school. Like yeah. Um, my question for you guys is, do you get excited to see yourselves on TV, or do you get anxiety? Because I know if it was me, I would just be, like, clenching to my seat, unable to talk to anybody. Like, I don't want to even, as soon as it's over, turn it off, I'm done. I, I want to ask Sophie that. Sophie, we, you and I have talked a little bit about that, actually, just about, you guys, you, I, this is what I find fascinating. These people live this whole experience. They go through it all nine months ago, and now they have to relive it again, which can be very good, or it can be not so good. And they have to relive watching stuff on TV, and maybe they don't, it's tough, right? I mean, there's good and bad. It's super hard. I mean, think about when you hate hearing yourself in an answering machine, and amplify that by like a thousand. Um, I personally am a big catastrophizer, so I manage to think about like what is the worst possible thing that could happen, and then I really focus on that. Um, so like I could find ten idols in episode one, and I would be worried that maybe I tripped on the beach and they're going to show it. Uh, so <laughs> that's my mindset. But there's always like a little bit of hope, right? Everybody on Survivor, I think, thinks the story revolves around them. Yeah. So everybody has that hope. Man, like this episode's gonna be about me. Like I'm gonna look killer. It's just for me. Like I don't listen to that hope very much. And you know, you know, I I would like to say to the three, to eight, whatever you are, to to spread the word. This is the truth of how we do the show. We spend all of our time and energy trying to figure out who should be on the show, and then we spend all of our time and energy when we're out there trying to get everybody's story as as rich and deep as possible. And we. If we know there's something that's powerful for you, like with Ethan, it's obvious, you know, you're talking about cancer, but other people have things that aren't as obvious. We try to wait for a moment that we know will get into the show. Maybe you have found an idol. That's when the producer on the beach would say, let's talk about what this means, because you left your kids, because we're trying to be an ally with you to say, we want your story too. We only have so much time, so let's marry it to something that can be in the show, but then, What's hardest, I think, for you guys is when we get back, we become, we become brutal in terms of what makes for the best episode. This person's going home. It's about them. This person is connected to her. She's connected to him. He's connected to her. She's connected to her. It becomes this little puzzle. And Sandra may have five hilarious scenes, but we just don't have time. And they don't in any way connect to the person who's going home. or. Any, and so that's when I feel bad, is that we leave all of this beautiful stuff. We're not looking for people tripping. That's not what we do. If we're showing you tripping, it's because either you've tripped like five times and now it is funny, or the trip is related to something that someone else has said about you. Like, you know, Sandra keeps tripping and then you do. Just know, we're, we never ever sit in an, in an edit bay or a story meeting and say, how could we make Wendell look, you know, cocky, because Probe said he thought he was cocky. We'd, we'd never do that. We are your best. We root for you guys. It just can't be everybody isn't, as Sophie said, everybody isn't the star of every episode. By the way, tripping is always funny. You should show more of it. Uh, but but no, to the point, it's interesting. Think about it. These people in an average episode are living 72 hours. 72 hours, and with 20 people, they probably aren't going to get 72 seconds of airtime. I mean, think about, that's weird. You come back and you had this huge experience over three days that might not be shown. It's easy to take that personally. But like Jeff said, there's a bigger structure and, here. And on a normal season, all of these people would have been right. stars of their season because yeah. they're just great storytellers. When you have 20 of them, it, it's just like an NBA All-Star game. Trying to get your hands on the ball is impossible. We have time for one more question right there in the awesome dress with all the faces of the people on it. Uh, look oh, at that yeah. dress, everyone. <laughs> came to play. Yes. Uh, What's Don your name? Martello. Um, I have not applied for Survivor. So, <laughs> um, so Ethan, and you mentioned you went back and rewatched your season. And I know in your articles, um, Dalton, I had gotten that too. But did anyone else go back and watch their own season when you won? And then did you kind of go back and watch other winners, you know, season thinking they might be on? You know, and, and who was that? That's a good question in terms of the research you guys did to, to go out there. Did anyone watch their own season or watch other people's seasons or do any homework? Really? Sandra's nodding no. I've done it I, before, but I was just coming off, an, of, off of Island of the Idols, and we only had two weeks before going back, so I was doing other things. I, no. 
Anyone do any of that? No. no. I mean, I went back and watched all the season. It's not all of them, but the seasons that where the people that I thought were going to be out there won. You know, there's so much time had, cha had passed, and, uh, you know, I missed a good five years of Survivor, and so I had to go back and just refresh my memory. Wendell, you're holding the mic up. Yeah, I must, I watched a couple seasons, especially, um, I mean, I'm a big fan of Heroes vs. Villains. Do we have any Heroes Villains fans in here? <laughs> So I rewatched that one, knowing, um, assuming that four villains will be out there. I also rewatched um, Game Changers. Do we have any fans of Game Changers out there? I rewatched Game Changers because um, there were some big time players that were eliminated relatively early, and also to see, you know, Sarah Lucina's game. Um, if you guys saw the pre-press, a lot of people wrote that they wanted to vote Sarah Lucina out early, and um, I, it's because of her performance in Game Changer, so I really wanted to study up on her. Yeah, smart. Um, guys, I just want to say, uh, th this has been a special night. They've never done anything like this before, okay? They've never shown a premiere <laughs> to people two days early with the cast up here on the stage to hang out, answer your questions, do this. I want to thank all you guys for coming. Yes. It's been a blast doing this. I'm so glad you guys were able to make it. I know a lot of you came from far away. You were hopping flights and getting hotels. Wow. It was very, it was super cool, the dedication of the fan base. I know it, because I see it every day when you guys are sending me messages or reading my articles. I appreciate it. I know how much Jeff appreciates it. I know how much all the players appreciate it as well. Be nice to them this season. Be nice to all of them this season. All right, I want to give a special thanks to Jeff Probst for letting this happen, thanks, making guys. this happen. It's because of him we're all here. Thanks all right? for coming it's because out. That of was him. super fun. All right, I also want to thank Parvati Shallow, Boston Rob, Amber, Ethan, Sophie, Wendell, and Sandra. Thanks, guys, for making it happen. Enjoy the season. Kicks off Wednesday night, winners at war. Have a great night, everyone. Nice job, dude. Thanks. You put a lot of time in.